The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, I'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, we're talking about holographic tomography. And uh, next slide, please. We can uh, just glance at the outline, but again, we'll speed through this. I know everybody's got class. So what is tomography? Uh, George, I think tomos means uh, slice in Greek. Is that correct? So it's basically uh, reconstructing an image from uh, cross-sectional projections. And this is an example of a uh, fan projections. This is parallel projection data. And the next slide. So uh, one of the key elements in tomography is uh, forming this radon transform property. And that's for any projection given uh, normal to an angle theta. Uh, it's defined as the integral over the path length um, gives you the projection intensity of your object. So next slide, please. Uh, that's related to the Fourier slice theorem, where, again, if that projection is done at an angle mapped into the frequency domain, that maps along a straight line in the non-diffracting case. So because of that and the linearity of the Fourier uh, slice theorem, we can reconstruct an entire image and get a map in the frequency domain with discrete points due to our discrete sampling size of the projections. So you can notice from this, though, that it's very highly sampled in the, the DC region. And out in the, the high frequency region, there's few data points. So what happens, this is the ideal case where we like even sampling throughout the distribution. This is actually what we collect with a discrete number of pixels. This is our filter. So there's different filter types, and what they do is they try to weight the higher frequency regions. So we end up with a nicely uh, reconstructed image without a lot of blurring due to the high dependence of the, the DC terms. So the different filter types, the most common is a ramp filter, which just weights it in this wedge fashion. There's a Shep logan filter. It's kind of like a sink form, cosine and a hamming. Pay attention to this cosine filter because it uh, drops off to zero at the high frequencies. You'll see that coming up. So uh, this example with this complicated image, basically we turned it into a transmission image where black represents uh, an opaque, white is transparent. That's the standard 2D Fourier transform. If we do projection mapping, and these are different scan angles, you can see that looking from the bottom up, you can almost pick out the image. The, the MIT comes through it you know, sideways. That's the projection you get in at 45 degrees. But those are mapped directly to the frequency domain as I depicted with the Fourier slice theorem. So next. Uh, that radon transfer, then you can map for every projection angle. That's here from 0 to 180. And MATLAB even has a color scale bone, which kind of looks like an x-ray. Go figure. So <laughs> next one. Next slide, please. So now we can reconstruct for a limited number of projections. So you can see in the case where we take 10 projections to reconstruct our image, there's a lot of artifacts. These are streaking, a lot of uh, noise within the image. And as you go up in projection number, you get a closer and closer, more accurate reconstruction of your original image. And then with the different filter types, this is the ramp on top, cosine on the bottom. You notice that I mentioned the cosine filter kind of attenuates the high frequency terms. And you notice that with a blurred image in the final reconstruction. So next. Um, we can also simulate noise in the projection, like one might get in a... Um, a real application. So that's noise in the radon transfer plots, um, radon transform. And then the reconstructed image with different kind of standard deviation values for the noise, you can see your reconstruction is noisier and noisier up to the point where it's virtually indistinguishable for high values of noise. Uh, next. So another interesting problem arises is uh, how many objects can you detect with very limited projection data? You can see with the simple square uh, the radon transform, which is also called a sinogram. I forgot to mention that. But um, it's pretty uniform throughout. But if you have four objects, you know, if you take a limited projection view, you, it might look like two or three even. So that's something in uh, applications that you need to take um, increased number of projections to actually resolve your, your kind of defects. Next. So that brings us to a standard object. And uh, this is a head MRI scan, or CAT scan, I think. Um, and that's a standard Shep-Logan head phantom, which is actually implemented in MATLAB. And you can 
uh, construct a radon transform of that image. Next. And you can actually look at how many projections you need to get to, in order to get accuracy. And this accuracy profile we defined as um, the difference in the actual reconstructed image per pixel, that magnitude squared divided by the number of pixels, and then normalize that with a, um, in relation to the actual image. So you can see right around 36 projections, you get a pretty good reconstruction. You don't need a huge uh, collection of data for this simple phantom. But in real life, you obviously want to maximize your projections that you can collect. But Aditya is going to talk about diffraction. Yeah, so uh, I'll just touch up a bit upon the diffraction tomography before we move on to experimental results. Uh, so uh, right up to now, we've just considered uh, a plane wave uh, just passing through an object, and we're not considering diffraction at all. But uh, light rays do not behave uh, that way. So a projection that we have uh, is quite different than just uh, just the line integral, which which uh, effectively is the radon transform. So uh, uh, so uh, analogous to what we have in the earlier case, uh, which was the Fourier slice theorem, instead of uh, mapping a projection at a particular angle uh, where we are eliminating it with an incident plane wave, uh, in the Fourier uh, domain. Uh, the transform of the projection uh, maps onto a semicircular arc instead of instead of mapping to a straight line. Uh, next piece. And uh, and the radius of uh, the semicircular arc uh, is proportional to the wave number. That's uh, the uh, so it, it's it's uh, in a way dependent upon the il uh, illumination uh, uh, characteristic. Next piece. Uh, so uh, just to uh, okay. Uh, just to show, uh, so once we are moving uh, towards lower wavelength, uh, we're just uh, going towards the earlier case where, where in the uh, in the Fourier domain we are mapping the projection onto a straight line. Uh, okay, so uh, like I just mentioned earlier, so if you change the uh, in the earlier case, we just change the orientation of the uh, projections. I mean, we are changing the direction from which we are uh, recording the projections. And uh, if also we change the frequency of the illumination, we are, what we are doing is we are trying to uh, map the uh, information of the object in the Fourier domain along uh, along certain frequencies. And the semicircular arc, uh, in a way, uh, uh, it's, uh, as you just, uh, can see, it's uh, we're mapping it uh, along a smaller disk, so it's, it's like a low-pass version of the original object. Uh, and uh, uh, so from from this uh, Fourier domain, we can just do an inverse uh, transform to to get uh, the information about the real object. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll just move uh, on to the fun part, I guess. Sure. Yeah, so. Okay. So we did a few experiments. This first one has with this little keychain object, and uh, what I did was just suspend it and spin it. And from that simple video. Uh, we grab some frames, just assuming it's a constant rotation profile, which is wrong, I know that. But um, from that, we created simple pr uh, threshold image values that were equivalent to uh, transmission data. And next slide. So from that, we can digitally reconstruct from these uh, kind of vertical cross sections uh, 3D slices of the um, projected image. And, and construct a three-dimensional uh, topography of our image. And next slide. So this is our reconstruction of the little keychain. And what's interesting, I don't know if the camera can zoom in on this. Where is it? Jeez. OK. Well, if Singapore can't see it. Um, there's a little white face and some white artifacts on this image. And those come up on our reconstruction as the holes, just due to the fact that the threshold values were set such that you know dark images were set to be um, transmissive. So another experiment we did with the help of Laura in her lab was uh, looking at transmission tomography um, in the lab using a plate wave light source, or white light source. And we have in this little test tube some uh, translucent gummy candy, and then surrounded by a sugar, trying to get index matching. Um, that was like a red fruit drink, I think. Then all that's in a, in a water tank. And the stage rotates. So the next slide. So from that, we collected uh, 36 projections, uh, one every five degrees. 
around 360 degrees. Yeah, so that's, or no, I don't know, 180 degrees, I'm sorry. So these are our collected images, and uh, Addy's got a little video, it might not work. No, okay, so anyways, uh, next slide. We can reconstruct that as well and get these um, uh, horizontal slices of a reconstructed image. This is a different color map. That's uh, MATLAB's color map jet. And uh, that's similar to what an MRI operator might see looking at, at slices through somebody's body. That's our reconstructed fan of um, uh, projection data. Next, and here's our uh, 3D reconstruction. And what's interesting to note is that we're able to reconstruct actually not only the gummy object, but the little air bubbles that don't really resolve in this picture. So that we thought that was really interesting. And uh, do you want to talk about applications? Oh, uh, sure. Okay, so the main use for this obviously is medical and biological. Uh, CAT scan, computerized axial tomography, and then other uses. This is actually a cell where they're looking at the internal structure on the, um, I guess, nanoscale. Next slide. And then uh, in the material science field, they're using this more and more. This is electron tomography, looking at the uh, PN doping of a silicon cell. And then that's a materials crystallography exercise, looking at the kind of nanostructure materials. And uh, last slide. So the diffraction effects, we didn't really get to experiment with, because that's somewhat difficult. It's kind of a cutting edge. And that becomes an effect, as Addy mentioned, when the material you're trying to resolve is on the same order of the wavelength that you're illuminating it with. So you can see for these different projections going across and then over, they're different um, distances, projection distances of the receiving end of their apparatus. So you can see more and more diffraction as you propagate further. And uh, similarly with the upper right case, that's a little tungsten wire. So the reconstruction takes into account digitally the diffracted pattern and subtracts that out. So with that, uh, any questions? Go back to that. Yeah, the gummy bear won't stay. Yeah, the shape of the gummy bear won't uh, won't stay constant. So what we did was uh, we just we just had two lumps of uh, candy placed at two different places, and that's what we're trying to. Yeah, we we ideally wanted to uh, get the original shape of the gummy bear, but uh, it won't stay the same. So yeah, it was actually broken up. Okay. So this it was part. broken up to fit into the test tube, and also it was it took some time to create the projections. So it started dissolving in the sugar water, <laughs> almost digesting. Also, there's a problem of it floating in the, in the medium. There's, there's a problem of it floating in the medium, so we just we just stuck it to the sides of the test tube. So, yeah. 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 Uh, why did you have to put it in water? Or was it just to show like what you would do in a medical application, or? Uh, sure. Uh, Laura suggested that we use, try to use an index matching fluid. So we don't get the lensing effect. And go back to the projections really quick of that. You can sort of see right here that it was forming caustics within the candy. So we were getting kind of a spherical lens formation. Also, we were, we were illuminating it with a, with a green light. We were uh, illuminating it with a different uh, color light. So that's what that's one yeah, reason as well. There was a green filter on the white light source. And we put it in red fluid to get maximum contact. Okay, thank you.